We had mentioned in the past that in existence, there's nothing that is superfluous. As vast as existence, everything in existence has value and has purpose. We had mentioned that, that the physical world, its purpose is to create a setting for challenges for the human being to be challenged. If he succeeds, then it impacts on himself, on an existence and brings about a level of perfection. And if he fails, the person himself is diminished and compromised. And that's what existence is all about. Do you succeed, do you fail? And how do you succeed? You succeed if you follow the script which God wrote. It's like no different in the physical sense. One eats healthily, you nourish your physicality, you exercise, you breathe, and you don't expose your physicality, your body to danger, then the body maintains itself and thrives and advances itself. But if you deny it, what it needs in its basic elements, the body regresses and it creates a certain deficiency. And if you have deficiencies, you have to somehow complement or supplement the intake of food to address that deficiency. If one doesn't do sufficient mitzvos, there's a deficiency. The commandments, the commandments themselves, the way God created the human being, the commandments themselves, as I mentioned, are only symbolisms. The tefillin we wear, the belief that we believe, the Shema we say, dietary laws, whatever they are, this directly relates to our spiritual makeup and through the physicality of our existence, decisions we make, it's either something which advances us or diminishes us. There's a famous word from the Shalak Kodosh, which I mentioned who he was. He was a great Kabbalist who lived in the 17th century, writes that Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, not on, only on bread alone does man live, but on, based on God's word does man live. It's not only through the physical, it's through the word of God. There is a spiritual aspect to the human being, and that's the word of God. So simply it means that why do we live? Not only when we maintain ourselves physically, it's only because God wills existence to function in a certain context. He explains it differently. A human being is a composite of the physical and the spiritual. The physical is sustained through nourishing the physical. What nourishes the, sp the, sp the spiritual? What nourishes the spiritual? So he explains that in every physical object of physical existence, there were sparks of holiness. When you ingest those sparks of holiness, the physical part of it, of the food, nourishes our physicality. The spiritual sparks which are contained within that food are absorbed by our souls. And that's the nourishment for our souls. She explains, if a person eats for the sake of God, to maintain his health, to serve God as he's meant to serve God, that's called lishma. I don't eat only to satisfy my, my desire. I don't live to eat, but I eat to live. 
And the reason why I eat to live is to be able to function, to do the will of God, then the body itself has the ability to extract those sparks of holiness and absorb them into the soul. Because that eating is not only purely driven by the desire to eat or to maintain our physicality, but it's also to nourish our spirituality. But if a person eats only for the sake of eating, as the body expels the waste of the food, after it extracts whatever has to be extracted from the food and the waste goes out of the body, those spiritual sparks also leave the body. They're not absorbed into the soul. They're only extracted from the food if there's a certain level of intent. If the intent is to do it for the sake of God, then the soul has the ability to extract those sparks and they're absorbed into the soul. Otherwise, it just goes through the body, back into the ground, and it's recycled. And until all those sparks of holiness are absorbed into the soul, the world just cannot reach its level of perfection. Because the objective is, the physical only exists for the sake of the spiritual, and the spiritual means that the soul should absorb the spirituality that's absorbed, which is throughout the world, throughout existence. So that's the meaning. Lo it's not only on bread alone does man live. It's not, the bread is not totally physical. But based on the word of God, meaning in that bread, in that food, in the physicality of what we eat, there's, there's a certain spiritual component. And that spiritual component maintains and sustains and advances our soul. This is how he explains the meaning of this. So the... There's a work called Yisod V'Shor Shavoda, the foundation and the root of all of, of the service of God. He cites a Zohar, which is the foundation for all Kabbalistic understandings, that we know that there's a hierarchy in creation. The human being is the ultimate level. Then you have the animal, the unintelligible animal. Then you have the fish, and then you have vegetation, which grows, and then you have inanimate, which is the stone, the earth, it's inanimate. That's the hierarchy. So he explains that food that's tastier, what is the tastiest food? Meat. Meat, which is from a living species, that's the tastiest. That indicates that the concentration of holiness is to a greater degree in that species than a lesser species. Therefore, in the land animal, domesticated, undomesticated, is the greatest concentration of holiness, and therefore it's indicated through the taste, it's tastier. As you go lower in the food chain, the fish, it is, it has, but not the same level as the meat, the domesticated, undomesticated, or the bird. And then you go to the fruit, the vegetable. But whichever one is in each category, the tastier indicates it has a greater consecration of the holiness. And again, and if you have proper intent when you eat that, and the objective is for that purpose of why you must eat that to maintain yourself, then you become a beneficiary, not only in the physical sense, but even the spiritual sense. That's the Zohar. But everything has its value, has its purpose. Everything is towards that objective. We find at the time of the Great Flood, although unintelligible species naturally procreate only with their own species, but in at the time of the great flood, they gravitated to other species, which is a total ab abnormality. The question is why, and the Torah tells us when God saw that the animal and the land has become corrupted and perverted, meaning even the unintelligent species, that was an indication to what degree 
the human being has failed. I mean, the human being's behavior was so errant, was so extremely off that all existence became corrupted due to man's behavior. Now, what activates all the energies of existence? We as being the center of the universe, the human being is the center of the universe. The world was created for the human being. As we said, this is the playing field. All that exists is to accommodate the human being. We behave and act within God's will. It releases great degrees of energy, which allows the world to thrive, to advance itself, and to function in the capacity that God created the world to function. But if we choose to live differently, and we write our own script, then the energies are not the same. The energy flow was not as intense. And not only that, the normal, the normalcy of the world is not the same. It goes off balance. When it goes off balance, you never know what, what the end result is. And even species that naturally only procreate with their own species, they begin procreating with other species because everything emanates from the balance of the human being. If you're balanced, the world is balanced. If the person's off balance, the world becomes off balance. And to the degree, as what happened to them in the great flood, they were so off balance, God says, I'm not willing to allow mankind's behavior to release those perverted, distorted, corrupted energies because that's not what the world is all about. It's not meant to be that. And therefore God says, I will destroy the world. I'm want, willing to start all over again. And therefore Noah and his family and the species in the ark, which were pure species, they were the beginning of a new existence for that reason. We find in time of creation, when he created vegetation, it says each species was created according to its pure species, whether it's the vegetable, whether it's the grass, herbs, or whether it's the fruit of the trees. Torah keeps repeating itself, lemino, according to its species. And it keeps repeating it. Each one of detail and creation, according to its species. It comes to the creation of the animal. Domesticated, undomesticated, again, let me know, according to its species. God created the world in a specific order. And why did God choose that order? The answer is only God knows. We have no idea. But the profile of existence, the order of existence, was chosen by God because ultimately, only in that setting are we able to bring about the end result that God wants us to bring about. God wrote the program, the script for this existence, how it should function. It's like you have a designer who designs a computer board and he wires it in a certain way so the computer should function and process information as it's meant to process the information. And if a person goes and rewires that board, the computer doesn't work or doesn't function or doesn't print out and process what, what's meant to be processed identically. God created the world to bring about a certain end result in a very specific order. God says, if you disrupt that order, it doesn't function as it's meant to function. It's not the world as it's meant to be. I'll give you an equivalent situation. Today, we have a thing called genetic engineering. Whether it's grain, whether it's fruits, vegetables, the fruits and vegetables, our whole food chain, is not as pure and as healthy as originally was before they got involved in genetic engineering. Where did this all come from? At one time, an acre of land, when you planted it, it was able to have a certain capacity of, of produce. Through genetic engineering of the seeds, and some, some of this is microscopic, they're able that same acre that was able to produce, let's say 15 bushels, they've gotten to the point that same acre could produce 
50 bushels, 100 bushels, because they said they gained for humanity and we're, we have very limited area, we have to increase the capacity of every acre of land. So they started to manipulate and change the genetic structure of everything. And therefore it's really, that's called genetic, but factually speaking, things are not as healthy because they're not as natural. Even when it says natural and something's organic, the organic that we have today is not the original organic that the way God created the world. I was reading a number of years ago, they had unearthed a pouch from the time of the first temple period. And in that pouch, they had grain. That grain was somehow preserved going back two and a half thousand years ago. And they analyzed the intensity of that grain and the quality of the grain Today's wheat, wheat kernel, wheat grain, qualitatively is not the same. Not the same. It's a whole different reality of what it was compared to what is today. Because when man begins manipulating and creating a certain artificiality to existence, it's not the original, it's not what God created. We've tampered with existence and therefore the body functions differently today than it functioned at one time. Therefore, today, we're susceptible to many more diseases or deficiencies, which you never had. But you'll say, look at life expectancy. We live so much longer because of the types of foods we eat and because of the lifestyle we have. So evidently, what science has done to the food chain, it's healthier, not less healthy. Again, longevity doesn't mean to say, today, supposedly, they say that the certain plants and herbs in the Amazon jungle, that if we knew exactly how to use and how to extract various things from these herbs, there'd be no need for medicine. These natural, the natural vegetation the body would be healed. It's only it's become a forgotten science, so to say. Therefore, we have to come on to all these, these pharmaceuticals to be able to deal with whatever it may be. I'll give you an example. The Talmud discusses a case. Today we have, you know, at one time, there was never a problem with insects in our fruits and vegetables. Why? Because we had something called, it was called DDT. It was, it was a, an insecticide, which killed the, all the insects. And vegetables were insect free. But you realize when you use those insecticides, it absorbs into the soil. And ultimately the vegetable, the fruit has certain elements and traces of that insecticide. And when you ingest it, it creates very serious problems. God forbid cancer or other issues. That's what it is. So therefore the government, they banned DDT. You can't use the insecticides because it became realized it's life-threatening. Ultimately, and therefore you have to deal with some other way. Naturally, you have to deal with the insects. So you have what we call uh, uh, hothouses. They grow in a protected environment where insects cannot enter into that environment insect-free environment, or whatever it is, or they came up with some other methods. But the Talmud discusses a situation that there was a certain grass that they would plant around the perimeter of a field, and that grass gave off a certain scent, which is not detected by a human being. We, we can't smell it, but it repels any infestation of insects. Insects will not go near whatever that produce that's being grown because of that grass. So naturally, the way God created the world, the world itself is self-sufficient in maintaining itself if you know exactly how to apply and how to process and how to function within this existence. It's there. You just know how, know how, you have to know how to use it. You have to know the playing field, so to say. But if you're ignorant and you don't understand, then you have, you have many issues, you have problems. We have infestations, we have this, we have that. It's a known fact 
that Africa, there's a shortage of, uh, of crops, there's starvation. It doesn't rain. Now, how do you take desert land and turn it into, into soil? Or many things. Based on the photosynthesis, all that growing, it's known that area that's, that's sowed with, vet, with, with vegetation, somehow it has a bearing on the rain. I'm not an expert in this field. I don't even indicate that I have, know anything about it. But I've read about it a little bit that there's a certain cycle that it has to do with what you do on the earth, in the earth. You sow it, you cultivate it, this and that. Somehow it creates a certain response or reaction that allows the rain, the moisture to go into the clouds and the clouds. And it's, it's a whole system of recycling that certain things rise and they don't evaporate, but rather they come back down as rain. And as a result of this, the areas that are desert are no longer desert for that reason. So again, the world has been abused. Humanity has abused existence. We've overtaxed it, but it's not we overtaxed it. As many human beings live, God created a world that's able to sustain all humanity. But it's humanity as God suggested, humanity should live within his world. But if we go and say, it's our world, we'll do what we want, and we're gonna deplete it, and we'll manipulate it, and we'll create whatever we want, you understand, God says, the natural energy flow that's meant to flow to bring about the bounty and whatever else is meant to happen, God says, I'm out of the picture. I'm no longer providing what's necessary for the world to function as I meant it to function. Of course, if it's your world and you decide to do with it what you want, then you fund it, you maintain it, and it becomes a different world. The world becomes a different world. Initially, there were two species, which we still have two pure species. There's a horse and there's a donkey. What happens when you crossbreed a horse and a donkey? What does that create? What does that produce? It produces a mule. A mule is a crossbreed between a donkey and a horse. In terms of the strength and the viability of a donkey, of a mule, a mule is stronger than a horse and it's stronger than, 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 than a donkey. And it has a certain movement because we know that a horse has the ability to move quickly. Also, it has abilities. The donkey has other abilities. Combining both abilities, it creates a different entity. But did you realize, you know, every mule is sterile. A mule, you cannot, a mule cannot produce another mule. So therefore, if you want to continuously to have mules, you have to continuously crossbreeding horses and donkeys. The Torah tells us that the first crossbreed of horse and donkey was by a certain person. Which is against God's will, because God says what he created this so-called illegitimate species, which is called the mule. It's called Predo. In Hebrew, Predo means a mule. In Hebrew, the word lipare means to separate. When something starts coming apart, it's called, it's nifrad, it's separated. When you create an entity, which is not the way God wants it to be created, although in the physical, it may be a stronger species, but that's not, it's not meant to last. It's not meant to be. To the point how it's not meant to be, it does not produce, reproduce. It cannot reproduce itself. It's stuck in the mud. It lives, it dies. You want to have another mule? You have to reproduce. You have to crossbreed another. But the person who crossbred the first horse and donkey, he himself was illegitimate. He was a product of adultery. And the Torah tells us regarding this particular person, he himself was a mamzer. He himself was illegitimate. He was born of a, a union which was not a proper union. So this person who had that deficiency, this flaw, 
he went and created something similar like himself. So his action was a reflection of what his essence was, was totally corrupted because it was, he was a product of someone else's wife where due to adultery, he came about. When that happens, the energy flows not the same. You know, a person who's, God forbid, the product of an illegitimate union, such as adultery, such as incest, he's, the classification is called mamzer. In Hebrew, mamzer is a, a conjunction. In Hebrew, the word mum means blemish. Zor means alien. It's an alien and blemish. It's mamzor, mamzer. That's what it is. A person who's illegitimate, although he's a full Jew, and he has every obligation of the Jew, but he cannot marry into the Jewish people. He could only marry someone of his own classification. He cannot marry a legitimate Jew. The Torah says, Lo, Yovu mamzer b'kal Hashem. A mamzer is not permitted to marry into the congregation of God. Of course, he has this level of illegitimacy, but he's, he's only a victim. He had no choice in the matter. The people who brought about this union, they did something which was forbidden, and he's a result of that. He's not at fault, it does make a difference. But factually what's needed to function within the spiritual capacity as a Jew, he has a deficiency or a handicap which does not allow that spiritual energy flow to flow as being part of the Jewish people. Although he's a Jew, but he cannot marry within the essence, which in the, the power system, which generates the power. Of course, because of his own spiritual deficiency, not due to himself, he cannot generate what's meant to be generate, generated. And if he intermarries, he actually does not allow the system to function as it's meant to function. But again, where does it all go back to? It all goes back to there's an order. And if you deviate from that order, the end result is not what God wants. And because it's not what God wants, therefore, it's something which is off. And if it becomes too extremely off, the whole system totally breaks down and collapses and doesn't exist. To be continued, we have a class at one o'clock in the portion of the week.